tonight. The former partner of Miles Sanderson sits down for her first television interview, six months after police say he went on a stabbing rampage at James Smith Cree Nation. Also, we can't send them big money every month. A retired couple is drowning in debt after their travel insurance refuses to cover huge medical bills in Arizona. Plus, from the streets of Meadow Lake to a special ceremony in Saskatoon, a homeless man receives a Queen's Platinum Jubilee Medal for his public service. This is CBC Saskatchewan News. It is Monday, February 27th, and the CBC Saskatchewan News starts right now. Good evening and thank you for joining us. The memory of last September's deadly knife rampage remains fresh for James Smith Cree Nation. This coming weekend will mark six months since the attack. Now, the suspect's former partner, Vanessa Burns, is speaking about that day in her first television interview. Olivia Stefanovic reports. Come on, come on, this, this is a community warning, period. From the outside, it was hard to know what was happening. Inside the tiny community, word grew that Miles Sanderson was on a murderous rampage. Everyone was fearing for their lives, especially his former partner, Vanessa Burns, and their five children. My son phoned me. I got a text from him too saying, Dad tried to kill me. Her 13-year-old was staying at her parents. He loaded a gun after Miles stabbed his grandma and grandpa. It was just so shocking. This wasn't the first time he attacked her parents. They tried to protect her from his constant abuse. But this time, her dad, Earl Burns Sr., died. I feel guilty. I wish I never met him. I feel like he just, he, he won, like he destroyed my family. I don't know, I kind of feel like a nightmare there, man, you know? Miles didn't just go after his children's grandparents. He also attacked his childhood friend. First, uh, the, uh, the paramedics counted 18, and I snapped out of it. Uh, they were counting like 20, 20 stab wounds, uh, a punctured lung. Somehow, he survived, but he'll never understand the monster Miles became that day. I don't know what the hell he was on, man. Wasn't too, there wasn't Miles, I know that, man. I know, like. It's just like, I, did I even know him? <laughs> you know, like, was that really him? That's what I thought. Like, was he just faking it the whole time? Vanessa tried to save herself and her kids, but nothing could shield her family and friends that day. It's just like a never ending pain that's. Just, it's just there every day. And. I don't know, I'm just trying to get myself some help and it's just, it's not working. <laughs> it just hurts so much every day. But she keeps trying for the sake of her children and grandfather they love and lost. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, James Smith, Cree Nation. It's a cautionary tale for those who travel south for the winter. A retired Saskatchewan man was hospitalized when he suffered a stroke earlier this month. Things went from bad to worse when they discovered their insurance would not cover medical bills. Pratush Dial explains. Arlene Lamotte is back home in Saskatchewan with a granddaughter by her side. But her husband Louis is in a Regina hospital and a huge medical bill has yet to arrive from the States. Excuse me. Arlene and Louis have been traveling south to Yuma, Arizona for 10 years. On February 3rd, he had a stroke. He was airlifted to Phoenix and the granddaughter Rebecca Fee drove down from Estevan. Every day we were washing his face, putting a cold cloth on him. He could only use hand signals or nod his head yes or no. Two weeks into his hospital stay, the couple was shocked to learn their insurance company Blue Cross had cancelled their coverage. The reason for refusal of coverage was a 10 milligram cholesterol pill dosage change. It wasn't a prescription change, it was just a dosage change. 
Um, whether he was unaware of this or he forgot, we can't confirm that yet. Fee says her grandpa disclosed a prior heart attack and lung disease on his application for travel insurance. Oh, I'm just disgusted with them. I just think what they did is just absolutely uh, unbelievable. When it was time to medivac Louis back to Saskatchewan. The only downfall was we had to come up with $56,000 Canadian to pay them up front before they would fly him home. Saskatchewan Blue Cross says we remain confident in the handling of the Lamoth claim, but can't release details for privacy reasons. It says it's essential to ensure that you update your travel insurer when health circumstances change. Fractions of a gram, that's a very tiny amount of medication, but nonetheless, what it signals to the insurance company might be something quite different than it signals to you and I, and that's why you've got to keep them in the loop. The family is still waiting for a medical bill that could be hundreds of thousands of dollars. We can't send them big money every month, so they're just going to have to, you know, take what we can afford each month. Then we'll have to pay it off, I guess, until we die. Arlene says her last resort would be to sell their house. Pratish Tyal, CBC News, Saskatoon. A report that could shape Regina's downtown for decades has been released. The 700-page document lays out a series of recommendations about which projects the city should pursue. Alexander Kwan dug through it all for us and found a few surprises. For months, the Catalyst Committee has been looking at what mega projects are in Regina's best interest and where to put them in the downtown. This is just a fraction of the more than 700 pages that make up that report, which means there's a lot in there. But here's what you need to know. The committee's number one priority will be a surprise for many as it was not part of the public consultations held last year. It's recommending the city build a walking trail system to link up many of the proposed projects. The trail would stretch from the Cathedral Area Community Garden to downtown and then to Wascana Park. Next up on the list, construction of a new aquatic facility. The Catalyst Committee recommends building the new $172 million aquatic center at the existing Lawson site. However, it does leave the door open to using the former rail yards north of Casino Regina as another option. Another twist is the inclusion of a geothermal plant to help heat the aquatic facility. The third recommended project is the construction of a new central library branch. It would cost $125 million and would require the city to tear down the current library and build a new facility in its place. The existing central library is in desperate need of repair and was built to serve a population that is less than half of Regina's current population. The fourth and final catalyst project recommended by the committee is the construction of a replacement for the Brandt Center in a still to be determined location in downtown Regina. It's expected that project could cost $156 million. The committee did not recommend the city proceed with an outdoor soccer stadium or baseball stadium as catalyst projects. The recommendations will be debated at length at this Wednesday's meeting of Executive Committee, where you'll be able to hear more public consultation and council debate. Alexander Kwan, CBC News, Regina. A homeless man from northern Saskatchewan received a Queen's Platinum Jubilee Medal today for his public service. Ernest McPherson patrols the streets of Meadow Lake at night to make sure other homeless people don't freeze to death. As Bonnie Allen reports, his story has also helped to spur the community into action. From the streets of Meadow Lake, where he lives, to this special ceremony, Ernest McPherson is one of a hundred Métis citizens to receive the Queen's Platinum Jubilee Medal. It's a great honor to be recognized for everything that I've done to help the homeless in Meadow Lake. We first met McPherson last November when he took us on a night patrol to stop other homeless people from freezing to death. It's like there's nowhere in the world for them and nobody wants them. They're really happy when they see me come along. That's why the manager of the local soup kitchen drove McPherson three hours south to Saskatoon to collect the medal. It's amazing. It's awesome to see someone in our community receiving honour like that for going above and beyond and caring for people that he doesn't have to care about, but he does. When we first aired McPherson's story, there was no place in this small northern city for homeless people to escape the cold at night. 
that has since changed. The drop-in center is now open overnight as a warming center until the end of March. Without it... I think people would have died. I do. This old church hall is being converted into a 25-bed emergency homeless shelter for next winter. Our local business people, God bless them, the best feedback I have from major government organizations is you guys are on the right track. You're, you've done good things, you've got business support, you've got city support, you just got to keep at it. There's also some grant money to tackle transitional housing. And just in time, McPherson's trailer seen here was destroyed by fire. He'd worked so hard to get to that place, and it's incredibly discouraging to see someone who's trying so hard just to get kicked in the teeth like that. Everything that he owned was in there. So he's back on the streets with the people he helps, but with some hope for shelter, even housing, in his future. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Meadow Lake. Well, it sure looked ni nice outside from indoors today, at least some parts of the day, but my goodness, the wind that combined with moments of drifting and blowing snow made for a really chilly start to the week. If you are a fan of milder temperatures, they are coming. Heather Morrison will have more in your forecast after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. It's a growing trend and a contentious political issue. Public money going to for-profit health care. Ontario is the latest province to increase the number of private medical clinics allowed to provide services. Now, a new survey gives a picture of what people think about it. Christine Birak reports. The pandemic has dealt a serious blow to health care in this country. Everyone agrees change is needed, but a new survey shows Canadians are split on what those changes should look like. The Angus Reid Institute survey found about 40% of Canadians firmly believe increasing privatization will make the system worse. Nearly 30% are in favor of more private care, and the rest say they're curious but hesitant. Some admit they don't really understand what privatization in health care means. It is complicated, so we asked some experts to help break down parts of it. Privatization is such a broad term that it's basically useless. I honestly wouldn't know how to address questions about privatization without first asking, do you mean financing or delivery? Because there's a big difference. Doctors are independent contractors. The difference is who's providing the care they're delivering and who's paying for it. When it comes to surgeries, in the public hospital system, a knee replacement surgery costs around $10,000. That's what taxpayers or the province pay. In a fully private, for-profit clinic, patients pay up to $28,000. But when the province pays for a surgery in a for-profit clinic, the amount is kept secret. Provinces won't say whether they're paying for-profit businesses more money than public hospitals to do the same work. Still, some may hope for-profit clinics will reduce wait times, which has been tried in British Columbia. Wait times haven't gone away, and some regions moved MRI scans back into hospitals. Similarly, cataract surgery, they repatriated those services into the public sector because they were more expensive in the private for-profit sector. We have an abundance of evidence that says increasing profit-making in healthcare is not the way forward. The Angus Reid survey says politics tend to drive people's views on privatization, but doctors insist there are cheaper, faster, safer ways of getting Canadians the surgeries they need, including centralized wait lists that send patients to the next available surgeon instead of sitting on one doctor's wait list. Some experts insist no medical system is perfect, but governments should be investing in changes that offer better health care to Canadians not profits to investors. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. This weather update is brought to you by the Capital Automotive Group. Trade and Upgrade is on now. And Heather Morrison is here now with the weather forecast. She says, well, 
blow you away. <laughs> okay, so my forecast might not blow people away, but the wind today, I'm certain did. Let's take a look at what we're dealing with today in this province. So the darker the color here, Sam, the heavier the wind is and the more intense. Now this is even dying down from what we saw earlier today. Regina hit a wind gust up to 55 kilometers per hour. So just a really windy day in the province. The good news is it's going to die down overnight. Tomorrow should be more mild, looking about 20 kilometer per hour wind speeds tops not getting up to that 40 sustained wind that we saw today in terms of temperature we're doing fairly well we're only a few degrees below normal for this time of year but with that wind today i think it felt a lot more cold than it, it was so even tomorrow as we're going to see it's going to drop a little bit in temperature it might actually feel like a warmer day because we're not going to have that intense winds so let me explain a little bit about what's going on weather wise so here's the upper atmosphere here. As you can see, we're stuck in these really dark colors here. That's that Arctic air that's pushing its way down into our province. So it's making it a lot chillier than it normally is this time of year. But that upper atmosphere is going to move on. As you can see, we're getting into those lighter blues a little bit throughout the day tomorrow, a little bit on Wednesday. And then finally, by Thursday, we're going to be sitting in a nice little trough in the upper atmosphere. So that's when that warm up is going to happen. Let's turn back to what's happening today snowfall wise we've got the saskatchewan low that's stuck in that northern part of the province it's really locked in there it's not going to be moving on for a while so you can see the snowfall accumulation about four centimeters out there in south end three centimeters in buffalo narrows so as you can see it's stuck there it's going to be moving on clearing about 3 a.m tonight but then there's this other system that's hovering around the u.s northern plains and that's going to be peaking its way into that southwest corner of the province. So if you can just look there at the bottom of the screen, so you're going to see this system that's going to be sticking around and sticking around for a while. They say they can't even predict how much snow. It might be between 3 to 12 centimeters, depending on how long it stays there and what area you're in. And then that's going to be pushing through with that low as we head into the upper atmosphere and we get settled into that nice little trough. So here's a look at your seven day forecast for Regina. So you can see that temperature trend. Going to be a little cooler tomorrow. Regina hit minus 7 today. Minus 10 is the the high for tomorrow so a little bit cooler but then that warm up coming for the weekend of course when we get warm weather we also get snow so Friday looking like a little bit of precipitation it's headed Regina's way as well and then we've got our forecast here from Saskatoon similar story but you can see our low tonight much cooler minus 23 and it's going to be a lot cooler with that wind chill we're going to be driving down into the minus 30s Wednesday we still have to stay locked into those cold temperatures and that's throughout the province it's still going to be a chilly day Day on Wednesday and then Thursday we get that nice beautiful warm up and then of course a little bit of snow like I said and we get to enjoy those more mild more seasonal temperatures throughout the weekend so Sam we have to put up with a little bit of wind and a little bit of cold but you know what March is going to come in like a lamb this year I hope it brings some sunshine with it that's a pretty cloudy <laughs> forecast Heather um, sorry you can only have mild temperatures you can't have sun too I can't have it. no cake and eating it too I got it yeah. All right, thanks, Heather. Thanks, Sam. Telemiracle 47 wrapped up last night at Prairie Land Park in Saskatoon, raising more than five and a half million dollars. The annual telethon raises money for the Kinsman Foundation's work in Saskatchewan. It provides specialized mobility and medical equipment, as well as travel assistance for those who need tre treatment outside of their home community. More than $157 million has been raised by Telemiracle since 1977. We'll be back after the break. Thousands of federal government workers will not be allowed to watch TikTok videos on their work phones anymore. The video sharing platform is owned by a company with close connections to the Chinese government. And today, Ottawa decided to ban its use on federal employee phones because of concerns about cybersecurity. We're looking carefully at how to ensure Canadians are kept safe online. Uh, and we're making the decision that uh, for government uh, employees, for government equipment, um, it is better uh, to not have them access TikTok uh, because of the concerns uh, that people have in terms of safety. The ban takes effect immediately. A joint provincial federal investigation into TikTok is underway. The company calls the ban curious and the U.S. and some European organizations already have some TikTok restrictions. 
Recently released figures show that the RCMP spent nearly $14 million during the historic papal visit last summer. Pope Francis came to Canada in July and apologized for the forced assimilation of Indigenous children at residential schools. Julia Wong looks at what one security consultant calls the cost of diplomacy. The pontiff spent five days in Alberta, Quebec and Nunavut last July. While here, the Pope made several public addresses, met with Indigenous peoples and politicians, and held large public masses. And he apologized for the actions of some members of the Catholic Church for their role in residential schools. Tens of thousands of people flocked to see him. This would be my first chance to see the Pope. I mean, how often has he come to Canada? Well, I was really happy to uh, have to come to this uh, mass. I. Uh, waited a long time for this to happen, you know? And so uh, I'm a residential school survivor. There was an enormous police presence at every site. Now, figures released to CBC News through an access to information request show the Mountie spent more than $10 million in Alberta, close to $3 million in Quebec, and almost half a million dollars in Nunavut to protect the pontiff. They cover overtime, shift differentials, travel expenses, and other costs. The vehicles, specialized vehicles, uh, you know, limousines, aircraft for, for support and for surveillance and for counter surveillance. You got the motorcade team, guys who are driving the the uh, Pope around, uh, the protective detail, the ones that are right next to him, protecting him, you know, blocking roads, sweeping for bombs, screening every guest at every venue where the, the Pope is going to be. Mather says the numbers may seem high, but he suggests that's the cost of diplomacy. It, it begs the question, should we be receiving these VIPs? Should we provi be providing them with this level of security? Should we not be saying, you know, don't come, but reality is if you want the world to be a better place, you gotta, you have to have dialogue and this is what foments dialogue, so I suppose. So uh, until that changes, we'll be guarding these people when they come. The figures are as of late November and Mounties say more costs will likely be processed. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. And Heather's back with a look at tonight's forecast. Hey, Sam. Well, we can take a look here. We are going to get into a bit of a chillier evening tonight. We're going to see these temperatures drop a little bit, minus 15 at midnight here in Regina, and then waking up to a bit of a cooler morning, minus 19 with that wind chill feeling, like minus 26. And a very similar story here in Saskatoon, so minus 13 overnight. That wind chill making it a lot cooler, and we're going to be waking up to that nice cold morning wind chill, minus 27 tomorrow here in Saskatoon. But you know what? We're cold, but we got nice things to look at. Thanks so much to Tracy Karatesh near Melville for this beautiful picture of the Aurora Borealis. Back to you, Sam. All right. Thanks, Heather. And before we leave you tonight, a historic weekend on the ice for two Saskatchewan teams at the Canada Winter Games on Prince Edward Island. Saskatchewan now still with an opportunity and what a goal. Saskatchewan. Regina's Riley Bryden scored the game-winning goal in overtime to clinch the bronze medal for Team Sask in Ringette. The girls defeated the host PEI 4-3. This was only the second time Team Sask has won a medal in Ringette. The first was back in 1999 when they also won bronze. A thrilling victory for them, but heartbreak for the men's hockey team in the gold medal game. Team Sask lost 3-2 in double overtime to Ontario, scoring for Saskatchewan with Saskatoon's Cash Andreessen and Macklin's Cole Reshney. It's the first men's hockey medal for Saskatchewan since winning gold in 1995. The Canada Winter Games will continue this week. And we will be watching. That is it for us tonight. For news anytime, you can head to our website or subscribe to our CBC Saskatchewan YouTube channel. Natasha Lipney and Heather will be back with more local news and weather at 11. Thanks for watching and have a great night.